Hi, I'm Professor Ed Gallier from the Fire Safety Engineering Group of the University of Greenwich, and I'm going to be presenting this paper, an evacuation model validation data set for high-rise construction sites, on behalf of my colleagues uh, who worked on this project who are listed, uh, listed here. This work is part of a larger project, a fairly unique project, uh, which is the first of its type to attempt to collect an evidence base describing how workers on high-rise construction sites react and behave during um, emergency evacuation. I need to acknowledge uh, the people, the organisations who supported uh, this work. First of all, it's uh, uh, Multiplex who provided us with a lot of assistance, uh, in particular providing us with two high-rise construction sites that we could use as part of the evacuation trials and also access to their workforce. Um, I also want to acknowledge the support of IOSH um, who supported, who funded this work, and again, without their help, um, we could not have done this work. The evacuation of high-rise construction sites are probably one of the most challenging evacuation scenarios imaginable. Uh, for a start, the physical layout is constantly changing during the construction phase, and so wayfinding is, becomes extremely difficult. The very surfaces over which people have to walk uh, can also be challenging. You can have decking uh, rather than solid concrete uh, surfaces. And so um, the, the presence of the decking uh, can make it difficult for workers to, um, to physically walk or evacuate uh, from, from the site. You also have uh, different types of connections between levels. Uh, you can have um, scaffold stairs, for example. You can have ladders connecting the different levels. Uh, some of the activities that the workers are involved in on the construction site uh, need to be made safe prior to evacuation. So when the alarm goes off, if workers are trying to, to, to hang um, glazing, uh, install glazing uh, when the alarm goes off, they can't simply leave the glazing hanging. They have to make that safe prior to evacuate. So, so the, the evacuation of construction sites are, ex, are extremely uh, challenging, uh, making this a very difficult um, situation. So um, to, to address this, um, in collaboration with IOSH and Multiplex, uh, the University of Greenwich ran four unannounced evacuation trials in two different high-rise construction sites to collect data, to collect this evidence base on how uh, uh, people respond and behave during evacuation process. In addition to this, we ran a series of trials to um, quantify how uh, workers can move over the different types of surfaces and also um, how they can uh, move between levels using the, uh, the, the temporary um, uh, uh, stairs or ladders that may be in place. Just before going into the details uh, of the work, it's worth identifying some of the key uh, areas uh, that, uh, that uh, we have a specific interest in. Um, so on the high-rise construction site, one of the areas is the top part of the building um, that I'm identifying here, which is called the formworks. This is where the building grows. Okay, So the concrete pour uh, occurs uh, in the formworks, and, and this enables the building to to, to grow in height. Uh, within the formworks, it's usually made up of two or three uh, decks. The decks are usually connected by ladders, so the workers have to travel between the levels using ladders. And the actual um, space in the formworks is, is usually quite congested um, with, the, uh, with the shutters uh, for being prepared for the, for the concrete pour. Uh, the second part that we are interested in is the core of the building uh, and in the core of the building uh, you may have um, uh, may not be complete in that uh, you don't have stairs in place and you may have uh, the temporary scaffolding stairs uh, to enable workers to move between the floors of the building the actual floor surface uh, in the core may not be completely um, concreted over uh, at, 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 this, at, at this particular stage, and so you have decking and decking with rebar uh, um, uh, over partial, over part or all of the floor surface. And then the third part of the building is the um, is the partially completed floors. 
So on the partially completed floors, um, it's similar to the core in that uh, some of these floors may be concreted over, whereas other parts of these floors uh, can uh, just have decking and decking with rebar. So one of the first questions we have is uh, how long does it take for workers to respond uh, to the alarm? Now to, to measure this, what we did was we installed uh, something like 30 GoPro cameras uh, throughout the core and the um, partially completed floors of the building and we installed the cameras the night before uh, we, we ran the trials. So uh, we installed the cameras and this collected the uh, video evidence um, uh, to enable us to do the analysis of uh, the behaviour of the, of the workers um, during the evacuation. Now one of the first things that we looked at was the response time uh, of the workers um, uh, in response to the alarm. And uh, we collected the data uh, from uh, three of the trials on two different building sites uh, and uh, we generated something like 156 unique uh, data points in total. And uh, the graph that you can see here is a plot of those um, uh, response times uh, from the um, uh, three different trials. And what you see is what we typically see when we look at response times is you get this log normal distribution of response times. Uh, the mean time in this distribution is about 1.2 minutes uh, and the maximum time is quite long. It's almost six minutes uh, for workers to respond, uh, for some workers to respond to the alarm. And, and these long times to disengage and the large number of activities that uh, workers undertook explains why we have such long um, response times uh, um, during uh, these, uh, these types of evacuations. Um, the second uh, component of the work we looked at was looking again at response times, but this time in the formworks. We wanted to see how long does it take the workers in the formworks to respond and, and whether that was different uh, from workers in the, in the main part of the building. Uh, and in fact, what we find is um, we have uh, two types of activity going on in the formworks, depending on the phase of construction. We have what we call high priority and what we've termed low priority um, activities. The high priority activities, these are time critical activities and they typically occur just prior to a concrete pour. So, for example, the workers are rushing to complete the installation of the shutters uh, in which the concrete is poured. Uh, the second type of activities, what we call, what we've termed low priority activities, and these typically occur just after a concrete pour. And so the, um, the, 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 the rush is, is over, you've poured the concrete, uh, and the workers are typically dismantling the shutters. We see that the response time distributions for um, low priority and high priority um, activities are, are different. They are statistically significantly different. And so we need two distributions uh, uh, to describe uh, these two different, uh, these response times at, during these two different phases of the work. Uh, and um, uh, and if, I, if I just focus on the high priority um, activities, um, we generate this curve uh, uh, for the response time distribution. And what we note, first off, that it's a normal distribution as opposed to a log normal uh, distribution. Uh, and that the, the uh, response times are significantly faster um, than the response times in the main part of the building. Uh, we have a mean of about uh, one minute uh, for the response time and a maximum of about 2.2 uh, minutes. So workers in the formworks uh, react uh, more rapidly to the alarm than workers in the main part of the building uh, and during the high priority activity, workers in the formworks uh, react slower uh, than workers in the formworks during low priority um, activities. The next thing we looked at was at how quickly workers could walk over the different surfaces. In total, we have 545 data points um, for uh, the various walking activities. Uh, what we found is that if we take the speed on concrete as representing uh, uh, as being one, when you walk uh, along the decking, uh, the walking speed is about 73% of the speed 
uh, on concrete. So quite clearly, the walking speeds are significantly impacted by the nature of the surface that they're walking on. And so again, we need to take this into consideration um, if we're going to do uh, evacuation modeling. Uh, the last thing we looked at in these um, uh, special trials, uh, walking speed trials, was the speed at which workers could go up and down uh, the temporary stairs. Uh, and this slide tries to summarize uh, the findings uh, of those experiments. And here we're comparing the speed on the stairs uh, on these temporary devices uh, compared to the average speed on a regular building stair. So what we find is uh, for the scaffolding stairs arranged in a dogleg arrangement, uh, the typical speed down the stair is about 84% of the normal speed we'd expect, the average speed we'd expect on a regular stair in descent, whereas in ascent, going up the stairs, uh, the speed was about the same as uh, for regular building stairs. And then for the ladders, we find it's about 50% of the descent speed on average, and ascent speed is about 67% um, of a um, of a standard stair. So, so now I want to just move on to uh, some of the validation uh, work that we did. So first of all, um, we modified the building exodus software to accommodate um, construction sites. We, uh, we, we enabled an ability to specify different types of floor surfaces and the direction over which you're walking, which is quite important. Remember, the speed uh, parallel to the ridges is very different to uh, perpendicular to the to the ridges if you're walking over decking. Uh, similarly, for um, uh, for the temporary stairs, we had to introduce the concept of the parallel and the dogleg scaffolding stairs, and also ladders. Now, the actual validation test case that we're that we're running uh, is one of the evacuations from the 22 Bishopsgate uh, construction site, and and here we have the main part of the building runs from level three to level 32. Uh, and the formworks ran from level 33 to 34. Uh, now, along with the validation uh, data set, it's also desirable to specify some objective performance measures uh, that can, can, can give you some idea of the level of agreement between the model prediction and the measurement. Um, we use the, uh, the metrics developed by Peacock et al. Uh, uh, because generally they're, they're, they're quite straightforward to apply and they're, and, and they're generally applicable to to a range of different types of validation cases where you're comparing experiment with, uh, with modeling data. Now, uh, the Peacock um, um, metric consists of three factors, which when you take, take them together, give you a, a, a good objective measure of the degree of agreement between the model prediction and the experimental data. Uh, these are the three measures. I'm not going to go through these in detail. They're described in the paper. Just very briefly uh, is the um, Euclidean relative uh, difference. Uh, this basically measures the uh, the, the difference uh, between the experimental and um, um, measured data points. It gives you an overall uh, measure of, of the distance between the two curves. Uh, ideally, you want ERD to be equal to zero. The Euclidean projection coefficient, uh, this is, um, is like a scaling factor, so that when you multiply all the data points by the scaling factor, you minimize the difference between the experimental and the um, modeling predictions. Ideally, you want the uh, EPC to be equal to one uh, to have um, ideal um, uh, uh, um, agreement between the model and the um, prediction. And the last factor, the last uh, factor is the secant uh, cosine. Uh, this looks at the shape of the curve and it sees how closely the shape of the experimental curve and the modeling prediction curve matches. Uh, you want the uh, uh, secant co uh, cosine to be equal to one to s if the two shapes are essentially identical. Okay, now uh, here we have um, graphs showing the evacuation curve. This is the time for the workers in the formworks to exit the formworks. This is the blue curve uh, shown here. And this curve here is the um, experimental curve for the evacuation of the entire building. This is to get all the workers out of the building. Okay, so that's this blue curve. Horizontal axis is time. Vertical axis is the number of workers out. Now, the orange curves that you see on both graphs, these, this is the average prediction 
from running 100 building exodus simulations. We generated the average exit curves from the formworks and the average curve from the building. Uh, and so the, um, uh, the, the model underpredicts by about 15% the total evacuation time. That's a pretty good agreement uh, through the evacuation. Uh, for the main building, so we overpredict the total evacuation time by about 4%. Um, there's pretty good agreement uh, between the, the, the curve, the predicted curve, and the uh, experimental curve. However, if, if you look at the time for 50% of the people to exit, um, we, we underpredict by about 22%. Okay, so um, there's some differences there. Uh, but all in all, I think um, from an a, a objective point of view, I think you'd agree we've got pretty good agreement between the model prediction and the experimental results. Uh, this animation just shows you one of the um, Exodus simulations running uh, for the um, validation case. Um, and as I said, subjectively, the agreement between the model and the um, uh, um, experimental results were pretty good. Uh, but it's important to, uh, to, um, uh, to bear in mind that there are some limitations with the experimental data set. Um, so there's some uncertainties associated with that. For example, the starting floor for all the workers was not exactly known. Uh, it was known to within a few floors, but we didn't know exactly the starting location of all the workers. Similarly, we didn't know the starting location on a floor for all the workers. Um, the uh, presence of clutter in the main part of the building wasn't recorded, so we couldn't uh, tell you, we, we didn't know for certain where all the clutter was in the in the main building. And obviously, we, we didn't use the precise response time distribution for this particular evacuation. We've used the, the average um, response time distribution that we're talking about, or that we're suggesting is appropriate for, for these types of, of buildings and these situations. Um, as we said, subjectively, we've got pretty good um, le uh, level of agreement just based on a visual inspection of the, of the predicted curves against the measured curves. But if we now look at the um, objective measures, uh, we, we get the data shown um, in the table below. Now, the way we've generated this uh, uh, data is that we've taken what we consider from the 100 simulations, we've taken what we consider to be the best of the 100 curves. Uh, because we're looking at how good is our model in the best of its uh, abilities to, to, um, to predict the evacuation um, si uh, situation. So we've taken um, the best case. Now, how did we define the best case? Well, we defined the best case as the one that gave us the minimum ERD uh, from the 100 repeat simulations. And so for the overall curve, the best ERD was about 0.22. I should say that the ERD didn't vary very much. Uh, so there wasn't a big variation in the ERD for the for the 100 cases, but this is, gives us the lowest um, ERD value. EPC, remember this is the scaling factor, is about 1.13. So um, uh, you can scale everything up by about 13%, uh, and that will get you closer overall to the curve. And the shape of the curve um, uh, gives us an SC of about 0.82. Uh, which again is fairly close to one. So this, this is these three sets of values are just telling us that we've got a pretty good um, objective agreement with the um, experimental curve. And if we take the overall evacuation time, um, then uh, the uh, evacuation time predicted by the model is uh, within eight percent of the actual evacuation time. And similarly for the prediction of the formworks. So you can split the evacuation into the formwork evacuation and the um, uh, main building and you can generate a similar set of data points. So, we, so these give us an objective measure. Now the validation data set can be downloaded from our website. Anyone can um, obtain this. You have the CAD drawings and you have all the data that you need to, um, uh, uh, to simulate uh, using your own evacuation model. And using these objective measures you can compare your model prediction against the Exodus uh, prediction. So to conclude then, a unique validation data set for high-rise construction sites has been developed based on data from a series of unannounced evacuation trials conducted in high-rise construction sites. The data set takes into consideration the impact of unique aspects uh, that, you, that you find on construction sites, such as the temporary floor surfaces, scaffold stairs, ladders, uh, and the response time of workers in construction sites. Uh, and, and also the difference between workers in the formworks and in the in the main building.
The use of the validation data set, including an objective means of assessing the performance, was demonstrated using a modified version of the Building Exodus software. And the analysis demonstrates that it's possible to predict the evacuation performance of high-rise construction sites with a reasonable level of accuracy if the simulation is adapted to take into consideration the unique aspects associated with high-rise construction sites. And I think that's important. Uh, there's a lot of unique uh, features that you find in high-rise construction sites. And so to use an evacuation model uh, to give you an, a reasonable agreement with what's going on on construction sites, you really have to adapt the model so that it's capable of representing these unique features. And finally then, to um, using such uh, validated software, it's hoped that the safety of high-rise construction site workers will be enhanced through the development and assessment of more appropriate evacuation procedures. Thank you very much for your time.